think two uh, lexical or two independent lexicons here. Uh, one and the same uh, word uh, can be, because uh, Tengut language has that, yeah? It has a great deal of amanimity. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, Sorry, also, that? It has a great deal of... Amanimity. Uh, many characters uh, sound the same. Oh, uh, sorry. Oh, yeah. I see. Amophony. Amophony, yeah, sorry. Excuse me, yeah. Amophony. Uh, that one thing. Uh, they sound the same, pretty much. Uh, another problem is uh, that uh, there is also a great deal of uh, synonymity. Uh, that is to say, uh, a single word, or an idea, or a concept, <laughs> or even a basic thing, yeah, can be also represented in a three or four different ways. Uh, now, if we look onto the distribution of that vocabulary, uh, then we can see yeah, that uh, the group, the majority of the texts, and the, the, this implies uh, the translations of the secular literature, uh, ten good own compositions, let's say on Buddhism, partially on Confucianism, or those ten good textbooks, uh, which we have been discussing also uh, the Buddhist texts uh, and uh, several others, and uh, dictionaries, of course. Uh, they all attest uh, basically for the same language. And uh, the rules of grammar, uh, which we have so far identified or established, I would say, yeah, because there are no pre established rules, we invented them ourselves. Uh, the rules of, they all apply to this particular set of texts. Uh, now, while we are talking about the tangled oaths, it's, they're not so many, yeah? but they're important for uh, history and ideology and mythology and everything. Yeah? Uh, then uh, one might say that uh, the rules which we have designed for the mean language, for the majority of the text, they do not work here including even the basic things, such as order of words. Uh, the problem is that, just as I said, uh, sometimes we have trouble even identifying where the verb is. Uh, whereas in standard tango, in the me language, it's actually very easily done. And there is even problem of sentence, of duanju, of dividing the sentences. Yeah? Because, again, in, uh, as we will see probably later today, in Tengut, originally, it's very easy to do. Uh, the verb is in the end, and the verb is very clearly marked, in most cases. Uh, whereas in the Lhi language, it's not that way. Uh, Kepping once suggested that we should be talking about Tengut ritual language. So it's uh, this language, but uh, present, but uh, it's the same Tengut language, but like written differently. Uh, in this circumstance, I would rather personally agree with uh, Nye who th thinks that it's different language altogether. Uh, for If we t talk about Tangut basic vocabulary, for example, uh, then in many cases, not in all cases, but in many cases, uh, we can actually find uh, a variety of cognates in tibet burman languages. Uh, whereas, and this really works for me, yeah? In many cases, if we take the numerals, for example, I mean, even in a written Tibetan, we can identify some. Well, uh, no, not all of them, but, but pretty cl clearly. Uh, whereas for the Lhi part, yeah, because we can translate, because the, the characters are in the dictionary. In one I mean, at least them all, yeah? Uh, but uh, when the phonetics, uh, the readings are reconstructed one way or another, uh, then we generally uh, have very big problem finding cognates anywhere. Uh, so uh, uh, this is something which I think, at least in my opinion, yeah, remains a task for the future. So uh, there are people who are saying that they know how to read those. I strongly doubt it, uh, to be honest. Uh, mm. Can I put this uh, in this way? So the relationship between these two languages is very similar to like the relationship between uh, classical Chinese and modern Chinese, like they use the same characters, but just they're sort of different languages, or they're similar to 
like Japanese, modern Japanese and uh, modern Chinese, they have many uh, shared words, but they're two different languages. Uh, could be, I mean, but uh, uh, I'm not sure. I mean, there is a very wild idea, uh, as I, I have mentioned that yesterday, and uh, I'd rather, I mean, uh, I... <laughs> Carol, tell us the wild idea. Okay, <laughs> okay the problem is, you, you know, uh, the ten good uh, rulers identified themselves as uh, Toba, yeah? Now, the word for Toba, yeah, is, uh, doesn't emerge in ten good language, yeah? Uh, what we have instead of the ten good imperial surname is Wemi. Yeah, it's... Uh, basically, a very close translation. Uh, very close in uh, Tang the uh, in Tang in uh, northwestern dialect of that period. That would probably be as like Vimy or something. Vimy, yeah, because the, uh, the the Nas landing was lost. Yeah, so it's Vimy. Uh, now, uh, if we look uh, into this Vimy, and uh, that's very easily done. And uh, just like I said, since it's so easily done, then. I strongly doubt its veracity, but uh, if we... <coughs> uh, I have a very little piece of it uh, uh, on that, but <coughs> it's basically like this. And, <coughs> excuse me, and Emperor Yuan Hao, when he declared himself the, himself the Tangut Emperor, and he claimed that he is the descendant of the Northern Wei. And uh, if we uh, consider, I think now uh, probably starting to get an idea of what I'm, what I'm trying to say. Uh, now the problem is that, uh, as we know, the Northern Wei Dynasty, they have uh, changed their name to Yuan. <coughs> Again, yeah? And if we uh, uh, examine the, uh, for example, Yuan He Xinzuan, yeah, the collection of surnames from the Yuan He era, yeah? <clears throat> there is a very interesting saying there, but I mean, that's uh, also the one which we have now. Yuan He Xianzuan is from the, uh, from the Yuan period, not from the actual Tang. Uh, but what it says there is uh, that after uh, the imperial house of the Northern Wei uh, changed their surname into Yuan, yeah, other Toba people, uh, they disseminate in the society, yeah, and part of those also joined the and whatever, so we can. It doesn't say that exactly, but one can infer. Uh, now, if we uh, go on and look at those uh, characters, if uh, like Wei and Yuan and also this uh, this way here, uh, one can say that if we, uh, uh, for example, examine uh, Guan Yun, yeah, uh, then we will see. Uh, that all the three characters, they have similar shanus. Uh, yi, yeah? They have similar initial consonant. Now, they are all uh, 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 the uh, So they have the yu, yu medium. And uh, they uh, only have difference in uh, the so-called dan. I'm not sure if there is an English word for that. Uh, that basically means that these three, uh, yeah, that this, this, and this, yeah, they are all, uh, they, sound, they sound the same, yeah? Read the same. Uh, now, if we uh, go to this second character, basically we can identify this one and this one. Uh, so, Yuan Hao's claim to be uh, a Northern Wei descendant uh, has uh, some uh, grounds, uh, has some ground in phonology. But just like I said, this is a very, very wild guess. So, uh, but if we go a little bit further and examine this particular one, uh, this is character. Uh, this is the second part of the Tangut Imperial surname Mi. Uh, which is rendered into Chinese as Mi, also Mi without nasal ending. And then again, uh, uh, sorry, it's uh, here. It is 
also Amonim with me, the people. <coughs> uh, so if, and graphically speaking, this part here, this part here, is basically this character in a reduced form. And this one, this me, it never emerges in any other context otherwise than the Tangut Imperial family. Uh, so my idea would be is that we can actually interpret the, the Tangut Imperial surname, Veni, yeah, as basically people of the way. Where at? Or uh, people of the And then if we go like this, and just like I said, I mean, uh, that's clearly fantasy. Well, but sorry. I mean, uh, uh, well, uh, and if we pursue it that way, then the language of Lehi uh, would be the language of the Northern Way. Uh, this is, or whatever language they were speaking. Yeah. But not Tibet word, something else. Uh, but just like I said, I mean, that's, uh, that needs to be, needs, need, it needs very, very hard proof. Yeah. Uh, for the moment, it's basically the uh, phonological uh, considerations. Uh, and phonology alone uh, cannot be, cannot serve as a, a proof for uh, historical facts. I mean, that's uh, my uh, understanding. Uh, so, yeah, then, uh, and there is something one of my colleagues has once uh, mentioned in a paper. I must admit that I haven't found uh, this uh, particular paragraph which he uh, quotes, uh, but there is this a very interesting observation. Uh, if I find it myself, I will uh, definitely uh, think it's, uh, it's very useful. Uh, uh, according to that colleague, uh, there is an instance where uh, Li Yuan Hao, the Tengu Emperor, uh, was addressing the Kitai and called himself Li Wang, uh, the king of Li. Uh, now, the problem here is that uh, we normally interpret that in a very basic way, as, of course, uh, all historians know, uh, Li for the Tanguts is a uh, uh, yeah, is a given presented surname. Yeah, the Tangu emperors, uh, the Tang emperors gave it to them. Yeah? And it was very popular uh, throughout the Tangu history because the Song dynasty also gave them uh, their surname Zhao, but they never used it. Uh, only in the dealings with the Song court. Uh, but the surname Li, they liked it. And uh, so this particular colleague has observed that if we write this into Tangut, uh, this Li, uh, one, of, one possible way to do it, because there was a specific character in, Chinese, uh, in Tangut to render Chinese surname Li. Uh, but if we uh, write it in this way, Uh, this will return Lini, uh, th that will be Li, Li, Wan, uh, the king of the Li people. Uh, but just like I said, uh, uh, this is all, uh, I haven't found myself this particular paragraph where uh, Yuan Hao addresses himself uh, as Li Wan, but maybe just uh, I uh, didn't uh, look well enough, uh, search well enough. So now, uh, uh, that might be, I wouldn't, uh, you know, if I were uh, to have a course in Tangut history, I wouldn't probably uh, dare to uh, talk about all this as an established fact, yeah? Uh, but it might be giving some uh, space for, for imagination. <laughs> and imagination is also very important for historians, as far as I can tell. <laughs> Without imagination, we don't get too far. Uh, okay, so let, let's get back to... <laughs> no, those are all fascinating subjects, yeah, but... Just... Mm. Uh, all right, so if we continue. Now, the translations of the Buddhist texts. Uh, then again, is very interesting thing. Uh, because if... Uh, uh, you guys uh, take a look onto the 
uh, what I have here, page 5, preface to the Lotus Sutra, also page 6, the imperial preface to the newly translated treatise of the great state of the white and high, and other things. Uh, then we will find out that the Tanguts themselves, they were very conscious about how they translated the Buddhist texts and how they worked with them. Uh, however, on the basis of surviving evidence, we cannot really be sure uh, what uh, they translate, what, what were the first things to be translated. And what was the uh, initial stage of Buddhism uh, among the Tanguts? Uh, we have a very limited uh, number of sources for the early period. Uh, for example, uh, uh, here, I suggest on the page 3, uh, there is this uh, Chen Tian Sibei, yeah, the, uh, the stele from the Chen Tian Temple, the one I've shown the picture by Zhang Shi. Uh, who was an official during the uh, Yuan period, uh, during the Yuan House period. If we read that thing, we will uh, 